Welcome everyone to Algebra 2, Section 7.3, Rationalizing the Denominator in Negative Exponents. So, a real quick reminder that with negative exponents, if it's something to the negative power, you either send it to the bottom of a fraction or to the top of a fraction, depending on where it was to start. So it always reciprocates regardless. So, example A, or 5A, um, would be 5 to the negative second, which is really 1 over 5 squared then it becomes 1 over 25. Go ahead and try letters B and C on your own. On B, it ends up becoming 1 over 2 to the third, which is 1 over 8. On letter C, the exponents on the, are the 3 to the negative thirds on the bottom, so it goes to the top and becomes 3 to the third, <coughs> and then we get 27. Go ahead and do example D on your own as well. Example D is very similar to C, where we make it um, 4 squared on the top, and then say, okay, 4 squared is 16. All right, um, I would encourage you to go ahead and try at least example 6 on your own, and if you um, feel up to it, go ahead and try um, example B on your own too. So 6A, x to the negative third, That'd be 1 over x to the third, and we can't progress any farther because we don't know what x is. Whereas on the previous ones on example 5, we knew all of those numbers. Letter B, we take the exponents of 1, and we multiply it to both exponents, and get x to the negative second, y to the negative second. Now they both go to the bottom of the fraction and become 1 over x squared, y squared. I do want to note that if y, for example, was a positive 2, we wouldn't have moved the y down, down to the bottom. We would have left y squared on the top. However, it was also a negative exponent, so we did move it as well. Letter C. So we would take um, positive exponent, positive exponent, positive exponent. Those all stay. Negative exponent, it moves. So you end up getting x, y y to the third over 2. So now since these are multiplying, we add, them, add the exponents and get x, y to the fourth over 2. It can be a good rule of thumb to deal with negative exponents before um, most other exponents. All right, D. Um, same idea, we're going to have positive, 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 those all stay. Negative, it moves. X, Y, Y squared, Z. And those really could be in any order, I just put them in alphabetical order. So then we end up getting X, Y cubed, Z. Um, example 7, they just start getting a little more complex. So I encourage you to try any of these, you feel up to it on your own. 7a, the 4 stays, but the other 2 move because they're negative. So 4x to the 7th over x to the 3rd. Now, since they're dividing, you subtract the exponents. And you get 7 minus 3, 4x to the 4th. Remember, when you subtract, you always leave it as a positive exponent on the top. Example b, so... I'm going to move all the negative exponents, keep the positive exponent where it's at. z squared, z cubed, uh, y, is cu y squared, excuse me, over y. So the negative exponents on the bottom move to the top, and the negative exponent on the top move to the bottom. Now as we multiply the z's, we get z to the fifth from adding the exponents. And with the y's, we get y squared and y to the first, so we end up just getting y. Now, we like writing it uh, alphabetical, typically. So I wouldn't count it wrong written like this. You could also write it like this, if you wanted to put it back in alphabetical order, which is what we typically prefer. Example C. Only thing that moves is the z to the negative second. So we end up getting 3y over z, z squared y. The y's, 1 minus 1 is 0, you're left with no y's. 
and the z's, z and z squared give you z to the third. So you get 3 over z to the third. All right, example 8, a and b. I would encourage you once again to try these on your own, knowing they get more complex. 8a, I would encourage you before anything else actually this time, distribute this exponent. I know I said earlier negative exponents, but sometimes distributing the exponent can change what you're going to do depending on if it's negative or not. Um, but it can always be helpful to just distribute it right away. So the exponents in there, negative 3 to the first really becomes negative 3 to the second. And that would be in parentheses there. So that way the negative would get squared too x to the negative second, and y to the fourth. Well, negative 3 to the second is 9. Negative 3 times negative 3. x squared goes at the bottom of the fraction, and y to the fourth stays y to the fourth. Nothing more we can do there. And example b, um, this time you can take the x to the negative second and x to the negative third down to the bottom if you want already, or we can multiply them together and then do it after. Either way, it doesn't matter. Let's see if I multiply them together first. I end up getting 5 times negative 2 is negative 10. x to the negative second and x to the negative third give us x to the negative fifth by adding. And y and y squared give us y to the third. So now, this ends up becoming negative 10 y to the third over x to the fifth. And like I said, you would have gotten the same answer had you done it this way, where you said 5 over x squared or 5y over x squared, and negative 2y squared over x cubed, because you would have said, okay, on the top, 5 times negative 2 is negative 10, y times y squared is y to the third, and on the bottom, x squared and x to the third would give you x to the fifth. So regardless, you get the same answer. All right, so that's a lot with negative exponents. On the next page here, it says warm up, we're going to continue solving these as if normal. Um, now, x plus 2, the cubed, is equal to negative 27. Um, so, to undo a cube, we would say, hey, how did we undo squared? So, when it was like x plus 2 squared equaled 9, for example, we undid it by square rooting. Because a square and a square root are opposites or inverse to each other. Now, recall square root is really like the exponent of one half. So you end up putting the exponent of one half on the square. I should write that differently, I'm sorry. You end up taking this to the one half. So what happened was you did x plus two, multiply those together and you just get to the first, which is why I undid that. But it looks, we just wrote it as square rooting. Well, we can really do the same thing here. But now it's just a different exponent and a different root. So when it's being raised to the third power, we want to take it to the take the third root of each side. So when it was a square, excuse me, when it was something squared, we would square root. When it's something cubed, we cube root. And if you want to think of it as fractions, you definitely can as well. All right, so now you're left with x plus 2 because they undid each other, and the cube root of negative 27 is negative 3. Only one answer because it's an odd root, not an even root. Subtract 2 to get x equals negative 5. And you can always check your work, and if you were to plug in negative 5, you would end up getting the answer to be negative 27, showing that, yeah, it did work. On example 2, simplifying this, well... We have 4 and 12. Those can just reduce outsides, so that becomes 1 over 3. The square root of x cubed and the square root of x cubed become the square root of x to the 6. We can add those exponents as we multiply those over the square root of x to the 10th. So now, since they're both square roots on the top and bottom there, we can subtract those exponents as well and get on the bottom, or on the top, you should, I should say, excuse me, the square root of x to the negative fourth over three. 
Well, it's a negative exponent, so we got to move that to the bottom. and get 1 over 3 times the square root of x to the fourth. Now, if you notice, I will say that, hey, 10 was bigger than 6. So we end up getting the 4 that subtracts on the bottom there at the end of the day. So if you want to think about it that way and kind of shortcut through this negative exponent, you can. Once again, how you would do that, though, is you take the bigger minus the smaller, in this case, 10 minus 6, and it stays as a positive exponent wherever the bigger one was. So in this case, the 10 was bigger and it was on the bottom, so it's a positive 4 on the bottom. But if it was 10 was bigger on the top, it would have stayed a positive exponent on the top. All right, example three. Here you have x, and it's not x cubed, but it's x times the cube root. I want to note that. And it's not 5 cubed, it's 5 times the cube root. So we can't currently add these um, because their the radicals are not the same, because this is 27x to the 5th and the x to the 8th. So we look to simplify. We say, OK, hey, the cube root of 27, oh, that's 3. And x to the 5th, um, I should have not written that x yet x to the fifth, we take 5 divided by 3, and we get 1. So we combine that 1 with the 1 out here, and we get x squared. The remainder is 2 for when you do 5 divided by 3. So it ends up being the cube root of x squared in there still. And that was from last lesson, section 7.2. The other one, 5 and 8 divided by 3, is 2 with the remainder of 2. So now you notice, hey, the radicals are now identical. They're both the cube root of x squared. So we can add these two together and get 8x squared times the cube root of x squared. All right, rationalizing the denominator. Remember that we used to do this before when there were square roots, OK? so. Before, when it was square roots, what we would have was a scenario like, oh, maybe it was 2 over the square root of 3. Well, you'd rationalize it by multiplying it by the square root of 3 over the square root of 3. And we would choose whatever square root was in the bottom because it would create 2 times the square root of 3 over the square root of 3 squared, which undid each other and thus left you with uh, 2 square root of 3 with just a 3 on the bottom. So the reason that worked was because we ended up having square root and a square root give us something squared, and that was the opposite. So here, we're going to have to get it not just to a perfect square, but um, get rid of any roots in the denominator by making the denominator a perfect nth root. So it can vary on which, what it's going to be. And I'm going to use that example I just talked about right up here um, to segue into how we're going to do one like 4a. So how you would do that would be, you would say, hey, this, this would really be like 2 over 3 to the 1 half. Well, and then we multiply it by 3 to the 1 half over 3 to the 1 half. So as we did that, we end up getting 2 times 3 to the 1 half over, and we added those exponents as you multiplied the like bases, and got 3 to the 2 over 2, aka first, which is why that became just a regular 3 on the bottom. So what we ended up having to do was getting those exponents on the bottom to add to a 1 there or any whole number will work as well. So we're going to apply that same logic here to 4a, where currently it's 5 to the 2 ninths on the bottom. So we're going to multiply by and say, OK, what times that would get it to a whole number, aka 9 over 9 for the exponent? So we say, OK, well, the exponents are going to add together. So we want 5 to the 7 on top, because 7 plus 2 would get us 9. And in order to add fractions, you need the denominator to be the same. So we put it over 9. 
We're going to do that for the top and bottom. Once again, big picture, we'll end up getting these two fractions uh, as exponents to add up to 1. And the reason that's significant now is you'll just have 5 on the bottom. And yeah, on the top it gets messy. 3 squared was 9, and then we just have times 5 to the 7 ninths. Now a better way than writing it like that would be to put parentheses around the 5 to the 7 ninths. And say, hey, 9 times 5 to the 7 ninths over 5. I would encourage you to go ahead and try letter B, knowing that you can't, you aren't going to get it to add to 1, but you can get it to add up to 2. So on letter B, in order to get um, the denominator, they me the exponent in the denominator to add the 2, you say, hey, what um, 4 plus 2 over, th um, and then put that over 3, the same denominator, would give you 6 over 3. And that would be like 3 squared. So we multiply, excuse me, not by 2 fifths, but by 3 to the 2 thirds. And we end up getting now 2 to the 5th, which was 32. 3 to the 2 thirds. And so on the bottom, it would be 3 to the 6, th 6 over 3, which is 3 squared. Now we can do 3 squared before we're done. So call it 32 times 3 to the 2 thirds over 9. Continuing on. Letter C, the fifth root of 3 fourths. I think you are going to be far better off in thinking of these as um, the fraction exponents, but if you would like to think them as think of them as radical exponents, you definitely can. Um, or some radicals, I should say, not radical exponents. Um, you definitely can. So um, I'll first um, talk about how we would do this if we were just to turn it into um, fractions and then solve it like we would on A and B. So this would really be like 3 to the 1 fifth over 4 to the 1 fifth. Now, I'm going to take that 4 to the 1 fifth and say that's really actually more like 2 to the 2 fifths. And the reason why that is is because 4 is the same thing as 2 squared, so 2 to the 2 fifths is the same thing as 4 to the 1 fifth because the exponent of 2 on the top is saying to square it. The reason why I did that is because now we only have to multiply by a 2 to the 3 fifths to get that bottom to be rationalized instead of a 4 to the 4 fifths. So it's a much smaller number we have to multiply by, thus saving us um, of getting massive numbers for um, not really a good reason. So, we're, um, the top is going to stay unchanged, 3 to the 1 fifth. So now we multiply the top and bottom, like I was saying, by the 2 to the 3 fifths. Because, on the bottom of the fraction, it'll get 2 to the 1st. On the top of the fraction, yeah, it stays messy, and that's okay. So that would be how you would solve it with fractions. Now, if you wanted to do radicals, I would still advocate for changing it to the fifth root of 3 over that fifth root of 2 squared. Now, in order to get this 2 into a number divisible by 5, we'd want it to be 3 more to get to 5. So we'd multiply by 2 to the, um, the fifth root. You need to have those roots the same of 2 cubed over the fifth root of 2 cubed. Or I should say on top of the fifth root of 2 cubed. And that would give you, on the top, the fifth root of 3 times 2 cubed. Let me write that figure. Over 2 itself, because it would be 2 to the 5th uh, the root of 2 to the 5th. Now, the benefit here um, would be that you would be able to say on the 
top, you can actually do 2 cubed and multiply that by 3, which would give you 8, and multiply by 3 to give you 24. So it would be the fifth root of 24 over 2. So it ends up looking um, cleaner for sure than it would have been um, on the uh, other alt other other option that we did earlier. So it's up to you which method you prefer, whether you turn it into fractions or if you turn it into radicals. Um, considering that we've already done examples A and B as fractions, um, I am going to do examples D, E, and F as radicals to give practice for those that want that. But if you want to turn it into um, fractions, you would continue on and you would get the same exact answers, just maybe written a little differently. All right, D, the fourth root of 2 over x cubed. So I'd write that as the fourth root of 2 over the fourth root of x cubed. In order to get this to be divisible by 4, we'd want it to be 1 higher to 4. So we'd multiply the top and bottom by the fourth root of x because we want to add 1 to it. So we'd end up getting the fourth root of 2x over the fourth root of x to the fourth, which we said was oh, just going to be x, which is why we did that. And that one's finished. I'm sorry, I should have covered this earlier. But on example E or C, excuse me, we could have actually gone further on this had we wanted and say, hey, let me turn to a smaller eraser and said, hey, what we could do here is cube the two and get three to the one fifth, eight to the one fifth over two. And now, since these are the same uh, exponent, we can multiply the bases and thus get 24 to the 1 fifth over 2 to make our answers absolutely identical to where you're still taking the fifth root of 24 or 24 to the 1 fifth, which are the same thing. All right. Um, so with that in mind, let's go on to example E. Example E, I'd still once again encourage you to just uh, separate them into the 4th root of 16 over the 4th root of x to the 14th. On the top, the 4th root of 16 is just 2. That's convenient. On the bottom, 4 and 14 reduce to 2 and 7. And then we say, okay, 7 divided by 2 is x cubed with a remainder of 1. So now we'd end up saying, okay, we just need to multiply by the square root of x on the top and bottom. So you end up with 2 times the square root of x over x cubed times what would become x, so x to the fourth. And last but not least, example f. I would ask you to try this one on your own. So we have the cube root of 16 over the cube root of y. I will note that the cube root of 16 is really like the cube root of 8 times the cube root of 2. The reason why that's significant is the cube root of 8 is just 2. So you have 2 times the cube root of 2 over the cube root of y. We would want to simplify that. Either at the beginning, in the middle, the end, doesn't really matter when. Now, we don't like that this is um, a cube root on the bottom or any root on the bottom. So we say, hey, it's currently a 1. How do we get to be divisible by 3? Well, if you can make it 2 higher by taking the cube root of y squared and multiplying that to the top and the bottom. So on the top, you end up getting 2 times the cube root, I didn't write that big enough, of 2y squared. And the bottom, you end up just getting y. And that would be your answer.
All right, so once again, whether or not you think of any of these in example four as fractions, radicals, um, realistically, you get the same answer every time um, as the other. They just might look like they're a different form, like we saw in example C. That is all for section 7.3 today.